Our topic today is steel Dell reinforced concrete retaining walls stabilizing systems by Patrick Brown of Earth Incorporated. Mr. Brown graduated from the University of Pittsburgh with a BS degree in civil engineering in 1992. Mr. Brown currently serves as vice president for Earth Inc, a geotechnical engineering consulting firm located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he has worked for the last 26 years. Earth Inc. primarily provides geotechnical engineering services for public sector roadway and bridge projects, along with relatively large size commercial developments. As vice president and senior geotechnical engineer for Earth Inc., Mr. Brown is responsible for both technical and administrative aspects of geotechnical and supplementary civil engineering projects. Mr. Brown is a registered professional engineer in Pennsylvania and is a member of several professional organizations, including the American Society of Highway Engineers and the Association for Bridge Construction and Design, ABCD. Please welcome Patrick Brown. Thank you, Jim. And I'd like to thank the ASHE National Committee for inviting me here today to talk on this subject. Um, let's let me share the screen here and Can you see that okay, Jim? Jim, can you um, can you see that? Yes, I can see that, okay. Patrick. You want to hit your presentation on your PowerPoint on the bottom right, and you'll be set to go. Okay, it shows like it's in presentation mode now. Is that is that the full screen? No, it isn't, but I'm sure hopefully it'll work for everyone. If you just keep going, I think you'll be fine. You'll be good to go. Okay. Okay, the project was the SR4099 Emergency Slide Repair Project in Westmoreland County, PA. The uh, owner of the project is the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation. Earth Incorporated designed this project under an open-end geotechnical engineering agreement with PennDOT District 12. SPNK assisted us with the project providing roadway plans, survey, ENS, and utility coordination. And Swank Contractors Construction was chosen as a contractor by PennDOT District 12 to perform the work. PennDOT District 12 is located in the southwestern part of the state. This is a map of all the uh, engineering districts in the state. And due to, to the geology and the topography of this area of the state, um, they have more active landslides than any other district in the state. And there's the project location relative to PennDOT District 12. SR4099 connects the- Patrick, your yes. slides are not advancing at this time. If you want to slide through them, I think whatever screen you're showing on is not reflecting on the pre presentation area right now. Um, so sorry about that. manually advance them. There you go. Thank you. Um, let me see. Is, is that in presentation mode now, Jim, or is it still just showing the slides? Just showing the slides, but it'll work if you just manually advance them. That'll be that'll work out well. Okay, I apologize for that. This worked fine in uh, when we tried it here. Okay. Okay, um, as I was saying, this is a map of all the engineering districts in Pennsylvania. District 12 is located in the southwest corner of the state, and due to the topography and geology of this area, um, they have more active landslides than any other district in the state. SR4099 connects East Vandergriff, which lies in the river valley here, to Vandergriff, which is located up on top of the uh, a terrace that, uh, formed by glacial uh, deposits. A um, couple things to note about East Vandergriff is that there are only two roadways that lead in and out of this uh, community. That's SR4099, which climbs the hill to Vandergriff, 
and Sheridan Road, which goes along the river valley. And both of these roadways, unfortunately, are um, have landslide issues that are uh, chronic problems. Another important thing to note about East Vandergrift is that all emergency vehicles or all emergency services to the borough are provided by entities located outside of the borough. So essentially, the, it's critically important to the people of this East Vandergrift that one of these two roads is always open, which is one of the reasons why this project was an emergency repair project. Um, again, this is an aerial view showing Vandergrift up on top of the hill, East Vandergrift laying down, lying down in, near the river. Uh, and this is SR 409, which climbs the slope um, about 80 feet in elevation. And properties on both sides of this slope have been afflicted with landslide issues with, uh, within the, or over the past 50 some years as the whole area is founded on a uh, colluvial soil mass. Here's a view looking, um, this is part halfway up the roadway looking down slope towards East Vandergrift. And you'll note there is a sidewalk along this road which the residents of East Vandergrift use frequently to get up to uh, Vandergrift Borough. And then turning around, this is looking upslope towards Vandergrift Borough just showing the current roadway situation. This is a soil survey map, which um, shows the slippage potential of soils in the project area. And it's based on the color-coded system showed up in the left-hand corner of the slide. And as you'll note, the project location is located in the red, which is considered high slippage potential. As I said, this whole area is in the project is located on a colluvial soil mass. Some evidence of past movement. Uh, this photo on the left was provided to us by PennDOT from 1974. And the photo on the right is from 2017. And you'll notice that those structures that are located on both sides of the roadway in 1974 are no longer present in 2017. And you'll note the house in the background there that the arrow is pointing to. This was the reason a PennDOT was called out to this um, location at that on that date and here was the issue there was a it was a uh, house located on the downslope side of the roadway and a landslide took out a portion of their basement and here's just another shot from inside the house looking at what used to be their basement here are some uh, other properties from 2005 both located on the upslope side of the roadway which by 2017 had also been raised. PennDOT went uh, back and looked at past aerial photography of the area. And um, from 1957, they identified 17 structures located on both the upslope and downslope sides of the roadway. And then 1993, there were 13 structures. And you go to 2014, and there are only four structures remaining. Um, and this is, this is how it is currently today. Now, I can't say that all these structures were raised due to uh, landslide movement, but I'd have to guess that the majority of them were, uh, had to be torn down because of slope movement. So we were originally called out in 2017 to uh, look at the area. And at that time, based on our field reconnaissance, we identified what we felt was the limits of the area of the ancient landslide. And this is shown in the uh, red um, patterned area. PennDOT has performed uh, several subsurface investigations of this area. They drilled the borings shown in the red in uh, 2006. And then in 2017, they went out and drilled some additional borings, those are shown in blue. And then for uh, final design, for the emergency design, we felt that we needed two more borings at the southern, southwest, southwestern portion of the uh, roadway here to uh, provide some, suffer some surface information there where we didn't, ha didn't have any. Um, oops, sorry. 
you'll uh, notice this orange area here on this map. Um, in PennDOT's 2017 subsurface investigation, they encountered some voids in the um, in the roadway or beneath the roadway, I should say, during the subsurface investigation. So they had their maintenance crew come out and do some repair work. So the maintenance came out and dug a two foot wide by eight foot deep by 40 foot long trench and backfilled it with class C. This was the area that they felt that they uh, encountered the voids that they had in their borings. Um, but during that excavation, they hit several obstructions. Uh, you'll note this steel beam sticking out of the ground. It appeared to be a railroad rail that had been driven vertically into the ground for some type of uh, support measure. There was several of these they encountered during the uh, excavation for the repair. They also encountered um, concrete and brick. So one thing that we knew from their June repair in 2017 was that whatever uh, stability resolution we came up with to fix this, we were going to encounter um, obstructions during the construction process. During uh, the subsurface investigation in 2017, PennDOT installed two inclinometers, both on the downhill side of the roadway. They were installed in boring F11 and F9, which are circled here on this map. And here's a photo of the, um, of the inclinometers. F9, which is in the background, um, they, again, they started reading these in about 2017 and got periodic readings over time. And based on the readings, they were showing that the movement of the ground at F9 was approximately a half an inch a year up until May of uh, 2020. And then from May of 2020 to August of 2020, they had an acceleration of movement and that happened to occur when we were out there doing construction work. F11, which is in the foreground here, they had over an inch of movement, average movement per year since 2017. However, in February of 2020, the, um, the pipe, uh, the inclinometer pipe pinched shut and they were no longer able to get readings. And here's just, uh, output from inclinometer F8, which shows that somewhat consistent half inch movement per year until you hit uh, May 2020, where that movement accelerated during construction. And here's F11. Um, I should point out axis A, which is on the left here, which is showing the, the movement is um, situated perpendicular to the roadway. So this one is showing the almost an inch of or a little bit over an inch of movement per year up until February 2020 when they can no longer uh, read the instrumentation. So the existing wall itself, which was located on the outside edge of the sidewalk, was constructed of various uh, materials. Uh, in the left hand photo there, you have poured concrete had been poured against a uh, corrugated metal sheeting. Uh, you also had stacked sandstone block, which is shown in the right photo, and you had masonry block. And actually, a portion of that masonry block wall collapsed sometime after February of 2020. And this happened to be right in the location of that inclinometer F11, which had, was showing um, over an inch movement per year. So we were actually out there in February for a um, field view and sometime after we were out there, this wall collapsed. So after we had a field view with PennDOT in February um, and we discussed various options, it was decided that about 480 feet of that roadway would need uh, to be supported with some type of stabilizing system. Um, so we looked at several different options, such as uh, large diameter drill shaft with steel beams in them, H pals or W sections. We looked at soil nail options, but what we ultimately decided on was uh, small diameter steel dowels drilled into bedrock. The bedrock varied from roughly 20 to 40 feet below the uh, roadway surface, with the bedrock getting deeper as you headed downslope towards East Vandergrift. 
once PennDOT uh, accepted the um, idea of using the steel dowels as a stabilizing system, they then brought Swank Construction onto the project. And this was in the very early stages of design. So it basically, we had uh, the, construct, the contractor uh, in communication with us during the whole design process. So it was a collaborative effort between the contractor, PennDOT, and ourselves. And we were able to um, design the system and present it to the contractor during the design stages. And they were able to assist us in saying what material they could get, what size diameter of pipe they could get, how they would approach uh, the construction of it and the construction sequencing. And that made the whole process a lot easier because we could tailor the design to meet what the contractor was gonna need out in the field. And once the construction started, it was pretty smooth because there, all the main questions had been addressed during the design itself. So the contractor was able just to get out there as soon as they were uh, awarded the project and just start constructing and no major issues came up during construction. So what did we design for? Um, we chose to do two parallel rows of steel dowels that were spaced three feet apart on center with each row also being spaced three feet, three feet apart. The second row was offset from the first row by a foot and a half. The uh, steel dowels consisted of seven inch micropal casing with 80 KSI steel. The dowels were drilled a minimum of 10 feet into the underlying bed, bedrock. The, uh, they were backfilled with neat cement grout with a 4,000 PSI strength. And in the bottom 10 feet of the dowels, we drilled an inch and a half diameter holes that were spaced three feet apart and rotated around the azimuth of the uh, pipe. And this was to allow the uh, grout to flow out of the pipe itself and fill up any angular space between the dowel and the drill bedrock. And then we uh, put a uh, con reinforced concrete face on the wall and we tied the top of the two uh, rows together with a concrete cap. And the, uh, the neat thing about the cap was not only did it tie the system together, but it was designed to be the uh, sidewalk. As you may remember that um, the photo of the roadway, there was a sidewalk that ran along the entire length of the roadway that was used by the community. So we were able to take the structural part, a structural part of the Dow system and also use it as a sidewalk and a curb for the roadway. Here's a uh, just the spacing of the dowels. Again, they were spaced three feet apart, two rows. The rows were also three feet apart, but as you can see, they were offset from each other a foot and a half. So basically what we had was a steel dowel every foot and a half along the roadway. Here's the typical detail that was used for construction. Um, again, two rows of dowels, 10 feet into bedrock, and we had a um, two foot wide wall cast along the outer road of dowels that extended three feet below the existing ground surface. The existing ground surface was rebuilt using Ashton number one stone. We had a five by three concrete cap that tied the two dowels together and also served as the sidewalk and the curb for the roadway. Uh, the space in between the dowels, we were showing a flowable backfill. However, the contractor elected just to fill the entire area up with uh, the concrete and at no additional cost to PennDOT. We had a uh, six inch drainage blanket beneath the wall consisting of number 57 coarse aggregate and it had an impervious membrane on top of it to keep the concrete from filling in the uh, drainage blanket. It had structure mounted guide rail on top of the concrete cap and we were showing eight inches of uh, reconstruction of roadway. Now, some areas of the road was in such bad shape that we had to go full width construction, but over the uh, majority of the project, we were able to do just an eight foot width. This is just a uh, detail showing the reinforcement in the five by three concrete cap and the two foot thick uh, wall along the outer row of dowels. This is a typical, sorry, this is a uh, typical cross section of the roadway with the dowel system in place. So what we, we chose two different uh, stability sections to design the dowel system. 
This was at station 88 plus 20. And the reason we chose this section was it represented an area where the colluvial landslide mass extended well up past the road. This is a road here, extended the furthest point up from the roadway itself. And also represented an area where the existing wall was highest. So what we did was for to develop um, parameters, we assumed a uh, depressed water table through here and back calculated for a factor of safety of one to determine our strength parameters for the colluvial soil mass. And then we elevated the water table to represent a condition where typically you would have landslide movement as the water table is elevated. And as you can see, it lowered our factor of safety from one for our back calculated number to a 0.79. We then use this critical failure surface as the surface for developing loads acting on the dial system. Um, from this development of the loads, we were then able to check the dial or design the dial system itself for embedment depth, moment of bending, shear capacity, deflection, buckling. This was all checked based on the, the loading produced by this section. And then once we developed the resistance provided by the dial system, we inputted that back in the stability analysis and it showed that we increased from a factor of safety of 0.79 to 1.86, again, with the elevated water table. We chose a second section also to evaluate the dial system. And this was chosen because this represented an area of deepest colluvial soil along the project. Again, we back calculated for a factor of safety of one for our colluvial soil parameters. And then we raised the water table to represent a condition of landslide movement, and that lowered our factor of safety to 0.78. We took that critical failure surface, used those loading values from that analysis to design the, uh, the wall. And then we inputted the resistance from the wall back into the stability analysis showed that we went from a 0.78 to a 2.1 factor of safety. We ultimately ended up with 318 dowels along the length of the 140 foot uh, repair. And this just shows the, um, the dowel locations along the roadway. So as I said, the length of the repair was approximately 480 feet. We uh, used 318 dowels. The dowels varied in length from 25 to 50 feet deep to socket them to 10 feet into bedrock. The total dowel quantity used was around 13,000 linear feet. And the height of the wall at the end was from four to 10 feet high. Um, the project was declared emergency in April, uh, uh, March 13th of 2020. The drawings were finalized in April, the design and the drawings on April 29th, and then construction started May 11th. The construction was completed at October 16th, and the cost of the entire construction was $2.25 million. Um, some advantages of using the dowel system as opposed to using larger diameter shafts or uh, soil nails was we knew we were going to run into obstructions during uh, construction. So drilling smaller diameter holes, it was easier to avoid the obstructions and to adjust the holes during the uh, construction, as opposed to a larger diameter hole would be uh, harder to adjust for the system. We, we did encounter a couple areas where one of them, we hit a couple of those uh, steel beams that I had shown previously that had been driven vertically into the ground. Um, and so we were simply able to just slightly move over our seven inch diameter hole and it wasn't affecting the, um, the, the design at all. Uh, another advantage is having the two rows tied together was we took advantage of the group effect of the steel and resisting the landslide forces and the earth pressure acting on the retaining wall. The inner row of dowels served as its own temporary shoring. So no shoring was needed during the design or during construction. 
The concrete cap was used to tie the two dials together, two rows of dials, but they also functioned as a uh, sidewalk and roadway curb. And the system allowed for the majority of work to be performed from the roadway or they, the contractor actually created a bench elevation without the need for placing construction equipment on the uh, steep slide prone downhill slope. Uh, here's a uh, shot from construction showing the dowels being uh, drilled in place. The uh, rig was controlled by this gentleman here with a remote control, so it was all done remotely. And here's the um, them lining up the dowels to uh, to drill. And it's, it's I know it's hard to see on this slide, but you could see one of the holes that was drilled in the lower 10 feet of the dowel to allow the grout to uh, flow out and fill up the annular space in the rock. Uh, here's a shot showing the uh, two rows of dowels with the excavation in between. And as you can see, the uh, inner row of dowels there is acting as its own temporary shoring. Um, it was holding back the soil, the roadway, uh, and that seemed to uh, work out fine. These, you can also see that these dowels have already been filled to the top with the uh, neat cement grout. Here's a shot showing the uh, reinforcing along the outer row of dowels for the wall. It also uh, shows the uh, drainage blanking extending out in front of the wall. And in between the two rows, there's a, actually a impervious membrane, which uh, it's hard to see it. It sort of looks like dirt, but it's a black impervious membrane there. It has some uh, dirt on top of it. And that was placed over the, uh, the drainage blanket to uh, keep the concrete from um, filling that up. And here's a shot of the completed project, the Ashto number one stone there to uh, rebuild the outer slope, the, the retaining wall along the outer row of dowels and the structure mounted guide rail on top. And here's a shot from the roadway level showing the, uh, the new sidewalk, which was also the cap for the two rows of dowels and uh, the new pavement. And with that, um, I thank you again for inviting me to speak on this uh, project, and I would be happy to ans answer any questions. Patrick, thank you for that very moving presentation. Excuse the pun. Yeah, I apologize it wasn't uh, working in the um, presentation mode. It, it had previously, but uh, hopefully you were able to see it. No, we were able to see the slides just fine. Thank you very much. That was very good. I appreciate that. Um, before we get to questions and answers, though, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you look in the chat, you'll see I've posted a number of links that I'd like to direct people to. Um, a recording of today's session will be available for viewing later at the Ash National YouTube page. So by all means, go ahead, check that out. Uh, also, before you leave today, don't forget to fill out your PDH form so that you can uh, get credit for today's presentations. Uh, also, take some time to um, go through and peruse the conference program book. Um, there's a lot of useful information in there, um, including some of the advertisers and additional information that people may find uh, of interest and may find helpful. So with that, let's go ahead and get into our Q&A. So our first question is from Pancho Garza, who asks, I see that you had variable dowel lengths depending on depth of bedrock. How was bedrock determined in the field? And I suppose that's depth to bedrock. Uh, yes, that was based on the um, subsurface investigation that PennDOT had previously performed in 2017 and 2006. And then we supplemented that with uh, two additional borings where they did not have any subsurface information. So based on the boring information, we were able to determine the uh, estimated top of bedrock along the entire length of the wall. And based on our estimation, it uh, turned out to be pretty close to what the contractor encountered in the field. Very good. Our next question is from Jody Sable who asks, were there landslides on the upslope side of the road? Was the road closed during construction? And were there utility or relocation issues associated with the project? Uh, 
yes to all of those. <laughs> the, um, yes, there was landslide movement on both the uphill and downhill side of the roadway that had been going on for, like I said, over the last 50 plus years. Uh, they've had a lot of issues. Um, and then for construction, we did have to close the roadway. The, uh, the borough was hoping that we'd be able to keep it open and only work in one lane, but it just wasn't uh, possible. It was, it was a tight roadway to start with, it was narrow. So it just wasn't possible to keep the roadway open during construction. Um, and then there were a few, very few utility uh, movements that we had to do. There were overhead power lines, which actually the company was able to come out and just sort of pull away for us at the one area where we're drilling underneath. And one, um, I think it was a sanitary line or a gas line that was supposed to be capped was uh, an abandoned. We found out was not abandoned. and. Uh, so we, they had to come out and uh, quite early uh, cap that gas line after we discovered it, it was no longer abandoned after, uh, during excavation it was discovered. So we did have a couple utilities that, uh, but for the most part, uh, there weren't any utilities running up the whole length of the road. They were mainly situated in the lower part of the roadway or a utility line running partway up the roadway. So did your solution uh, rather address the upslope movement then? Yes, the, it, it is. Well, it's to support the roadway. The roadway itself should be stable. You could have movement um, in the land up, uphill of the roadway, and you could have some movement on the uh, downhill side. But the roadway itself, it was meant to stabilize the roadway. And we looked at it globally. So. Uh, as far as global movement, there shouldn't be any that should affect the, the roadway, but you could have um, some minor slope movement up and down the slope where the dowels are not in place. But we were looking at a whole global uh, movement of the roadway itself. What it, sort if that makes sense there. It, it does. It's, so it sounds like if there was any additional movement outside of the road, it was more of a local phenomenon. Is that fair to yes, say? Yes, it'd be localized areas. Uh, closer to the, the surface. It, wasn't, it wouldn't be any deep failure surface. It'd be closer to the, uh, the ground surface itself. Um, I did forget to mention that the, uh, the one inclinometer that was uh, still working after construction, PennDOT continued to monitor that and it was showing no additional movement after the dowels were in place. Uh, in terms of commu community concerns, was there any outreach to the community um, and, and what did that consist of? Yes, uh, the community, uh, the borough of East Vandergriff has a board and we had on all of our meetings, the, um, the president of the board was present. There, there, it was all virtual because this was during uh, the pandemic area and um, she was present at all meetings and provided input to us. And so we had an open line of communication with the borough explaining how long it would take, what, what was going to be happening. So that, um, that worked well. We have another question here asked anonymously, which is, will new, inclin will new inclinometers be placed for continued monitoring? Well, like I said, uh, the, the one was is continuing to be monitored. That was F9, F11 pinch shut. And so far, based on the results of that, I was just talking to PennDOT the other day, they, uh, they're they thinking about um, stop stopping the monitoring of that, at least doing it a lot less frequent uh, period because it is showing no additional movement uh, since this has been installed. Right. Um, let me see. We uh, we're currently looking for some additional questions. Um, oh, here we go. From Daniel Snow, the question uh, is: Was there load testing performed on the micro piles? If so, how was it performed and at what frequency? Uh, no, the we used micro pile casing, but these weren't true micro piles. There was no um, bond zone below the casing. They were mainly to provide um, lateral support. We weren't vertically loading them. So it wasn't, uh, we, it was designed originally to be any type of pipe, but the contractor during the design said, hey, I can use, I wanna use micro pile casing instead of just 
uh, typical pipe. I can have it readily available. And we have the machine to do it. So that's why micro pal casing was used, but it, it could be used with any type of steel uh, pipe. So, so no, no load testing was done because there was no vertical load acting on these. It was just, we just ensured that the embedment depth of the pipe was embedded deep enough to resist lateral loading. Did the change in the, the pipe type require any kind of design reviews during construction? Uh, no, because that was determined right off the bat. We, um, we, as soon as, like I said, PennDOT accepted the use of uh, steel dowels to support the roadway, they brought the contractor in and the contractor at that point said um, well, they would prefer to use micro pile casing instead of uh, pipe. And we said, that's fine. Just let us know what size is available and and they did and so we designed it to fit that particular casing gotcha so we have a few minutes left here if if uh, anybody else wants to jump in for questions okay here we go uh will or has this strategy been employed elsewhere in the state uh, yes, we've actually done three other projects in PennDOT District 12 using this same design. Uh, another question. Was vehicular load on the rail considered or was this load not significant when compared to soil loading? It was uh, considered as a, uh, yeah, a live loading during the, uh, the analysis for the, it was, it was factored into a landslide loading, I should say. So when we were back calculating for our colluvial factor or strength parameters, we had the live load surcharge due to traffic loading in there. Okay. We're still hunting around for questions. Again, folks, be sure to check the chat for all the links you need for the uh, PDH form and for the uh, Ash National YouTube page. Uh, you may find those things to be useful. Um, let's see if we've got anything new here. I do not see any new questions just yet. Well, um, I think we're pretty much closing out then. But Patrick, I want to thank you, thank you for an extremely interesting presentation. It's very engaging, very informative. And Bob, I want to thank you for moderating the Q&A portion for our conversation today. I'm going to be pushing everyone back to our lobby area very shortly. If we don't get any questions in the next minute, I see one more popping up there for you, Bob, to, to talk about. Sure. What was the cost? Sorry if I didn't notice it. Uh, it was $2.25 million. So was that on budget, over budget? That was right, right around right. budget. Um, right. The original budget was we're considering a little less, but when they uh, decided they wanted to do more full depth pavement, they being PennDOT decided, oh, we want we want to increase the full depth pavement of some of the roadway. That increased it, but that was accounted for. But overall, it was uh, it was on budget. Right on the money. Interesting. Yeah. With regards to the time schedule for the project, did you hit your schedule there, or how'd that work out for you? Yes, within, uh, I'd say within 10 days or so. Um, some, some of it, the micro pile took a little bit longer to install at the beginning, just uh, just due to the, uh, the process. But once they got started and, and got on a roll with the installation of the micro pile, it went very smoothly. The only thing that extended it, I would say, was, um, was the additional roadway work. Not, not the structure work itself, but when they decided to increase the roadway work, that, that pushed it beyond what we originally thought was going to be the date. So I, I, would, I would say then maybe we were about 20 days over, but that was accounted for based on additional roadway work, not the structure work. Right. Well, once again, I want to yep. We have another question okay. from right. Greg Kuczynski. Did it have any impact on the design or construction schedule? Uh, fortunately, it did not. Um, everything was, we did have a couple field view meetings with uh, PennDOT and we followed the, their, uh, their protocol for doing that. 
um, and everything was done virtually and it did not affect any of the schedule. So we were fortunate there. It, it, it's that we met out there in February. Um, soon after we met, things were then shut down. Uh, PennDOT went uh, everything remote, virtual, but we were able to, uh, to continue the design process and communication with PennDOT and the contractor via Zoom and, uh, and everything just continued to uh, flow smoothly. Chat real quick, Jim. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing anything in chat. That's good. Q and A. Let's see if we got anything else in there. 